Hey guys, welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. You're not feeling well again. Well, no, I feel pretty good right now. We're just passing this crud back and forth. Oh my God, it's just my life now. Brand new year, brand new crud that you're never going to get rid of. This is just life, right? Yes, okay. just, yeah, mucus is my life. Yay, we'll just sit in it. We have our live show coming up. Oh my God, I'm we so excited. We are just a week away from the live show. And we've already sold quite a few tickets. I mean, we're more than halfway sold out. Uh, Yeah. If you want to get tickets to our live show in Asheville, North Carolina on Saturday, January the 18th at Fleetwoods, got to get those tickets now. I'm wondering if we're going to sell out completely. Well, I, well, by the time the people come to the door, like I said, that was me. I always show up at the door of a place. I never pre-buy. I have a feeling people might get turned away. This is very exciting. Yeah. I've been working on trying to get us some merch for the show. We've been deep diving into this case. Yes. Brand new case for the live show. You got to come check it out. It's, it's going to be so much fun to get to meet some of our Mountain Murder family. I know. And I actually checked the attendees list on the Brown Paper Tickets website to see who's coming to the show. Interesting. Some people we don't know. Some strangers to us. Really? Yes. Yeah, so we're going to have a great opportunity to make some new friends. Oh, that's awesome. Have some drinks. Kick Can't back. wait. I know, right? Let's go ahead, dive into the, I'm using the word dive a lot. We're going to dive head first into this case. Now, I have to tell you guys, this case is the one that propelled me to put together Mountain Murders. Oh, wow. I heard about this case. I read the book. I got really into it. And I was like, I've got to do a true crime podcast. This has to be my very first case. Well. Then I started writing one of the players in the case. Who oh. happens to be in prison. We'll get into that. I don't want to give too much away, but we had a little bit of a correspondence trying to get him to talk to me. Would you send him pic naked pictures? He's like old. But well, anyway. He still um, wants to probably see some naked pictures. I don't know if his eyesight's that good, honey. Mm -hmm. I don't want to give him a heart attack. But like, uh, can I get some de intimate details about your case? Oh, I'm sorry. Just say, they're real and they're spectacular. Oh, they're I want to see those. Oh, you do all the time. Okay. So this case, I'm very excited to finally bring to Mount Murders. It's taken me a while to write it up. I wanted to make sure we had the full story, all the good details. Are you ready, Dylan? Yeah, let's just go straight into this one because I want to hear all about it. I know. You're pretty excited, too. I'm pumped. There's a perception, especially in sex crimes against women, that the victim is at least partially responsible for the wrongdoing or the harm that befell them. Right. I hate I see that. that. all the time. It's disgusting. It is a prejudice against victims. Often victims are re-traumatized if they have to go into court. It's a secondary type of victimizing where we minimize the severity of what happened to them, doubt the truthfulness, and then blame the victim. Yeah, or at the very least, they're going to have to relive this horrible moment in public. But all that other stuff is what happens. And every time me and you've talked about this time and again, this is why you see women drop charges, women not take it to trial, come to some kind of an agreement with the prosecution. For this very reason, because they're going to get shredded by the defense, slut sh you know, slut shamed, and why were you wearing that? Why were you out that time of night? Oh, how many partners have you had? All this stuff that does not matter. You know, has nothing to do with what this asshole did to the victim. But that happens every time, and it totally disgusts me. We'll find throughout the story I'm about to tell you many of those same overtones uh, come, oh, come along God. with this case. Okay. And our case today is no different, though it did occur 49 years ago, so almost 50 years ago, in Madison County, North Carolina. So that hasn't changed, that whole treating victims like that it happens to this day. Nancy Dean Morgan was born January 15, 1946, in Texas. She was the daughter of Colonel Earl Adams Morgan and his wife, Abigail. Nancy definitely lived a very middle-class life. She was the second daughter of three children. Like a lot of military brats, Nancy moved with her family from base to base. She spent some time in Europe, living in West Germany, where her father held a very prestigious job as Director of International Law for the U.S. Air Force in Europe. He had a high security clearance, and CIA officers were often dinner guests, you know, just popping by. Yeah, that's a pretty high position right there. <laughs> Nancy was a gifted student, especially in languages. She picked up enough German to be able to speak it rather fluently, as well as French. She was in high school classes with Priscilla Beaulieu, who famously dated, then married, Elvis Presley, Oh, while she was in West Germany. 
Her high school years were pretty typical of that time. She was like a bobby soccer in the little saddle shoes who liked music and sock hops. The quintessential what you think of growing up in like the 50s and early 60s. That also always looked like so much fun. The young people were having a lot of fun back then. You know, I actually wrote a paper once for um, a class on youth culture in the 1950s. Oh, wow, did you? it completely changed okay. um, our society. Because it wasn't until that period of time that people looked at kids as um, consumers that things started being targeted towards Oh, kids. yeah. I mean, there's like a whole bunch of stuff about it. Oh, yeah. It. I've watched about like the dance shows and like Dick Clark and all that stuff. Yeah, that that's when they really figured out, hey, we can target these kids directly through advertising, things like that. And yeah, that was a big, that was a big deal. And up until that point, it was like kids were to be seen and not heard. Yeah, Dick you Clark. You were basically born to work on the family farm. Right. Your parents didn't really give a shit what you had to say. You know what I mean? It was yeah. like, just shut your mouth and do what I tell you. But this period of time really kind of changed the face of American youth culture. Right. So she was like engulfed in this, you know, loving the Elvis, loving the early rock and roll, little poodle skirts, that kind of thing. Nancy graduated from Mount Vernon High School in Alexandria, Virginia, and attended Radford College, where she earned B's in health, English, and psychology. It was during this time... She fell in love for the first time, but suffered a pretty tough breakup. What do they say? The first cut is the deepest. Oh, somebody sang that. (laughs) Right? She dropped out of college and went to work at a ski resort in the Blue Ridge Mountains. She eventually did go back to school. Her father urged her, you need to finish your education. You're a very bright girl. You got to do something besides be a ski bum. I mean, he's a very disciplined army dad. Well, very accomplished person as well. So she graduated from Southern Illinois University with a degree in social welfare, where she was on the dean's list. Nancy was very interested in the civil rights movement. Her friends said she often talked about wanting to make a difference in the world. Okay. Again, being a product of her time, getting caught up in the 60s. In 1970, Nancy was an anti-poverty volunteer with the VISTA program, Volunteers in Service to America. And so looking into this program, I guess it's kind of a bit like AmeriCorps today or Job Corps, but the VISTA program really focused on very poor areas, such as Appalachia. The workers would come in, they would help do community organizing, maybe try to bring um, knowledge about health, you know, medical care, dental care, um, you know, basic just sort of hygiene, taking care of yourself. You know, things like that. Yeah, these uh, communities surrounding us right now, the infrastructure and stuff's way behind. Could you imagine back then? I mean, I, I bet there's literally like dirt roads everywhere. Oh, and, definitely. You know, no no kind of uh, infrastructure at all. I mean, just a little town store, you know, dry goods store, literally still happening. Some say it was after reading the book Christy by Catherine Marshall that she really felt compelled to kind of take up this type of work. Christy is also a book about, I guess, a young woman who goes to kind of a rural area, is trying to help the people there. So she's feeling really inspired. Her work with Vista included setting up a thrift store and helping with children. She would set up a lot of different um, programs and events for kids, kind of try to set up like in these very rural areas, like kind of a little bit of a community center. Yeah. Like if there was an old abandoned cabin or something, hey, can we clean this up? Would hold, hold socials you know, little get-togethers, kind of um, groups or clubs for kids. Yeah, the community centers are very important to these small towns back then, especially because there wasn't a lot of entertainment and places for people to gather together. Exactly. Vista was a one-year commitment. When our story takes place, she really only had a few more weeks in the program as she had planned to begin nursing school in the fall of 1970 in New York. Nancy spent 10 days training for Vista in Atlanta And once she was finished with that, they assigned her to Madison County, North Carolina. By all accounts, Nancy was quite a liberal. Her political awareness developed during the tumultuous 1960s. People described her as an extrovert. She was very outgoing, never met a stranger, and was very self-confident. People took notice of her because she walked with, as they say, what, chin up, tits out? 
Like she was just, well, tight, yeah. you know? Yeah. And even women were uh, put in their place, if you will, back then. And so you got this bright, smart young woman who uh, has a, you know, has a path she wants to take and then wants to help people. And that's automatically not only the rural, rural, I can't say it, rural, rural, rural areas, but you're going to have the, the racial, you know, issues come starting to come up, the civil rights movement. She's seeing all this stuff happening and she wants to be right there in the middle of it. And I mean, many people probably would have described her as a feminist. Well, yeah. Yeah. And that was scary to. Was very scary. Scary and, to the men as well. Back and then. all of this will come into play in our story. Okay. She enjoyed things like bowling. Attending a Loretta Lynn concert in Asheville while she was working in Madison County. Nancy was known to joke with men of all ages, which often made her threat to local married women. Though Nancy was very sensitive, she recognized the poverty all around her, but she never came off as better than the people she was trying to help. Right. She just wanted to be very relatable and down to earth to these people. Right. And so she really tried hard not to come off as snobby or I think I'm better than you. Madison County, if you don't know, is probably one of the most interesting, least known, and misunderstood counties in Western North Carolina. There are 16, like, westernmost counties in our region, Western North Carolina. We live in Haywood, which is one of those. And Madison is a neighboring county. 55,000 acres of pristine national forest. The world's third oldest river, the French Broad, cuts through the area. Famously known for hot springs, yes. North Carolina. Max Patch, one of the most beautiful, amazing Raw, areas. Yes. My favorite hiking spot. Panoramic 360 views. Fucking gorgeous, Max Patch. I've never been up there. Right off the Appalachian Trail. So a lot of people who do Appalachian Trail hiking, Max Patch is a huge destination point for them. Um, just gorgeous. And then, of course, Mars Hill College which I think now goes by Mars Hill University. Ooh. But it's still a rural place with generations of families who've never left. By June 1970, Nancy had taken a group of kids to the Mars Hill College swimming pool. While at the pool, she bumped into her friend Ed Walker, another Vista worker who brought another group of young people from the Spring Creek community. Okay. Which is in Madison, really out there. Yeah. What you got to understand about Madison County is ain't nothing close. It's still that way. You, if you live in Spring Creek, it's probably going to take you 30 minutes to get down into Hot Springs. Yep. Going to take you probably 45 minutes or maybe an hour to drive down into Marshall. There's not a straight road around. Curvy ass roads. Yeah, narrow. Narrow, two lane. No, uh, no up gas on the stations. Side of a mountain. A no lot of anything. Them. I mean, Hardly it's any a, houses. It's a pretty rugged, still pretty rugged area. It's beautiful. It is gorgeous. But there's nothing out there. A lot of motorcycle, um, like cyclists or, uh, you know, bikers really like that area. It's right. like the Moonshiner, I think, is the, the road that they take. Well, yeah, they can cut it across. It goes from Haywood County into Madison. Yeah, and then you can shoot off right straight into Tennessee. Yeah. At this time that they meet up, Walker invites her over to dinner on Sunday. Saturday evening, Nancy had a friend, uh, Ruth Hensley, who was uh, another woman living in the area that was not local to the area that had married a service member who was serving in Germany. Her husband was coming back and was being stationed in Charleston. Nancy had invited Ruth and her two kids over for dinner and to spend the night. Ruth and her kids were leaving the following Sunday morning for Charleston, where her husband had the new assignment. So they were going to be, you know, moving. Permanent change of duty station. And because Ruth and Nancy were friends, Nancy insisted, you need to come over, spend the night. I want to drive you to the bus stop. So she can see her friend one Let me time. take you to the bus station. Like, right. Don't get a cab. Don't get a ride. Let me take you, you know, because this was the kind of person Nancy was. The two stayed up late. They got up early, and then Nancy drove the trio to Marshall to catch the bus. By 5.30 that evening, Nancy had made her way to Bluff, which is the area where Ed Walker lived. The two strolled the property when she arrived. He showed her the barn, the well, the spring, and the woods surrounding the place. He's living in this old mountain cabin. This is all very fascinating to them. Right. They did not come from this area, so being surrounded by this beautiful mountains and this really old timey way of living, I mean a barn. It was a novel. Spring, a spring house. Right. That's not stuff you see every day. Yeah. The pair picked some lettuce and onions from the garden. Nancy cooked omelets and some lettuce wilted in bacon grease, which we like to call around here that's kilt lettuce. 
Oh, I, okay. I didn't know Have you that. ever had kilt lettuce? No. Yeah, you You're take country-er it. than I it's am. It's true. 